In the latter part of the 19th century, the esoteric mystery teachings of the Earth's dark and archaic past were beginning to infiltrate Western philosophy and permeate through Western society. Spiritualism was burgeoning among the masses and becoming so commonplace that psychic readings and astrological projections were prominently appearing in newspapers and periodicals throughout Europe and North America. Many an average citizen was making routine visits to mediums and even engaging in seances with the explicit intention of communicating with the dead or contacting beings from other dimensions or even other planets. Secret societies of every kind were springing up like weeds in nearly all major cities, bringing into popular practice forms of paganism and sorcery that had been dormant for many an age. Such was the climate in which George H. Pember published his critical literary work, Earth's Earliest Ages. George Pember referred to all of these occultic practices as intercourse with demons and saw in them a reemergence of the characteristics of antiquity and the teachings of the Nephilim. He viewed the phenomenon of the rise of spiritualism in the West as a harbinger of the end of the age and the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he warned that the teachings of the fallen angels were not to be taken lightly, but must be understood as the impetus destined to usher in a repeat of the activities that, that brought the world to ruin in the days of Noah. He cautioned against the foolishness of underestimating the intellectual appeal and power of occult paganism. For many centuries, the true nature of the early systems of religion was unsuspected by Christians. It has been usual to regard paganism as a mere brutal worship of sticks and stones, as a gross superstition so utterly devoid of intellectuality that, when once expelled, it could never return and again deceive an enlightened and educated world. It was carelessly assumed to have sprung from ignorance and mental incapacity, whereas its wonderful power of adapting itself to the carnal mind should rather have suggested an emanation from those powers of the air which affected the ruin of our first parents. And to suppose that anything which comes from such a source need be wanting in intellectual vigor and beauty would be a folly as great as that which represents the fallen son of the morning under the guise of a horned monster. There is little chance of escaping his snares unless we recognize the fact that the resources of intellect are yet at the command of himself and his hosts, that still there is some soul of greatness in things evil. Pember viewed the occult as a practical force having access to forbidden knowledge that was not only tantalizing to the human mind, but also tangible, since it often dealt with ancient scientific secrets, which in some cases could be translated into functional technology. He surmises that occult science has probably transcended all merely human knowledge. And since we are told that all occult societies have been affiliated, and therefore have in some sort carried on a continuous study. We are fain to admit, upon this assumption, that they may long ago have passed beyond the limits of modern science, seeing that the latter is the accumulated experience of comparatively few generations. Still more ought they to have advanced in metaphysics and psychology, studies which they have ever regarded as the most important. Earth's Earliest Ages spends a considerable amount of time addressing the tenets of Theosophy, which Pember believed to be, essentially, the teachings of the Nephilim, rehashed into a new philosophical presentation more suited to Western minds. Theosophy is a proprietary blend of multifarious esoteric traditions from the mystery teachings of the East, although its primary influence seems to be Buddhism. It draws upon the age-old occultic practices and legends of many cultures and amalgamates them into a New Age religion that is both highly sophisticated and extensive. The architect, primary proselytizer, and venerated matriarch of Theosophy was renowned Russian occultist Helena 
Petrovna Blavatsky, otherwise known as Madame Blavatsky. According to Madame Blavatsky, the tenets of theosophy were communicated directly to her by the Asiatic Brotherhood, who are said to reside somewhere in Tibet and are famed to be the great masters and keepers of the ancient mysteries, or as we know them, the forbidden teachings of fallen angels. After devoting herself to occultic pursuits for some thirty years, Madame Blavatsky withdrew to a Himalayan retreat where she spent seven years under the immediate direction of the brothers and was initiated and instructed for her mission. She was then dismissed to the outer world and having proceeded to America and attracted there a number of sympathizing minds, she organized the Theosophical Society at New York under the presidency of Civil War veteran Colonel Henry Alcott. This was in the year 1875. The objectives of the society were then set forth as follows. 1. To form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity. 2. To study Aryan literature, religion, and science. 3. To vindicate the importance of this inquiry. 4 to explore the hidden mysteries of nature and the latent powers of man. Besides these publicly stated objectives, the Theosophical Society harbored a secret ambition, one which George Pember was able to discern from the very beginning. The prime objective of Theosophy was, and is to this day, to infiltrate and destroy fundamental Christianity, and by doing so, to usher in a new world religion that would consolidate all forms of spiritualism into one doctrine, the apotheosis of mankind, otherwise known as Luciferianism. Pember notes that spiritualism and theosophy, along with all mystery religion creeds, are exoteric and esoteric forms of the same system and the product of intercourse with demons. He explains, We have seen that the rise of spiritualism, which is a return to the demon intercourse and wonder-working of ancient times, soon resulted in a revival of occultism or the pagan philosophy. These systems, therefore, though they may be at issue upon one or two unimportant points, have no real antagonism. There are but different aspects of the same faith and will doubtless continue to exist side by side, just as they did in the old heathen world, theosophy becoming the creed of the educated and intellectual, while spiritualism influences the masses of mankind. Finally, Pember addresses in great detail the occultic doctrine of transmigration, or reincarnation, as it is most commonly called. He notes that all of the mystery schools teach a form of self-redemption whereby a man, after passing through many trials over the course of many lifetimes, becomes a Christ and attains to the nirvana of the Buddhists. According to the statement of the Himalayan adepts, an ordinary being must pass through some 800 incarnations before he can complete his purification from sin and attain to the rest of nirvana. During the weary ages of these existences, he must struggle with blind fate and with his own corruptions. There is no God of love and of all comfort to whom he can look and pray. He must either, by his own painful and unaided exertions, raise himself to the gods, or retrograde in ever-increasing misery and vileness, until he drops unpitied into the bottomless abyss of annihilation. This doctrine of transmigration from life to life until redemption is finally achieved by one's own rigorous efforts, at least according to Pember, exhibits some appreciations of the frightful nature of sin and of the gigantic task set before the man who would fain be his own savior. And this concept of salvation without a savior is the most glaring difference between the mystery teachings of fallen angels which lead to deception and death and the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is truth and life. We who are in Christ 
are saved by His virtue, by His sacrifice, and not by our own, as Pember articulates with supreme eloquence. With what thankfulness should we turn to the gracious Lord, whose blood speaks better things to us, who, looking on the sin-stricken and penitent face of the paralytic, said, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven, and in a moment effected that work for which Buddha demands ages, who beholding with pitying gaze the fast-falling tears of the contrite woman at his feet, took the burden of her guilt upon himself, and bade her depart in peace. No melancholy, unbefriended, and almost endless way lies before his disciples. Nay, he himself is with them always, even unto the end. He guides his sheep through the wilderness of life, gently leading those that are with young, and carrying the lambs in his bosom. He has not only borne the sins of his people, but will also sanctify them wholly, spirit, soul, and body, and present them faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy, by that mighty working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. This concludes my analysis of Earth's Earliest Ages by George H. Pember. Certainly much more can be said about this incredible book and its dire content, but better than any analysis is a reading of the book itself, which you can procure from Defender Publishing at RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Reporting for SteveQuayle.com, I'm Timothy Albarino, and that's my analysis.